I've learned a lot over the four decades of health and fitness and being in the trenches with the greatest in the world. And one of those things I've learned a lot more about and how to build better muscle is nutrition and how it has changed over the decades. And that's why I have the Titan meal plan for you guys out there that are confused about nutrition. I'm going to set you straight. Get a hold of me today. The link will be in the comments down below for you guys. Everybody, get over to the Titan Meal Plan, and I'll see you in the Titan Crew, where I will fine-tune any difficulties that you're having. Well, we are back again. It is the Mike O'Hearn Show here on Generation Iron, and it's really kind of cool for me to have today's guest on here because this is someone I learned a lot from. And again, it wasn't from talking to him. It wasn't from reading anything he wrote. It was solely from me watching, watching um, the way he performed, the way he was backstage, and the way he was on camera. And I'm talking about uh, one of my fellow brothers, uh, my gladiator brothers, Dan Clark, aka Nitro. We have, well, it's already, already out now. Netflix just released a new gladiator um, documentary. So make sure to go over and watch that. But today we are sitting down and talking to him. And uh, there's so much I want to get into. I have no idea where this is going to go because there's over 30 years of uh, friendship. And uh, more than that, it was he helped develop me. But I want to get into the root of what we went through as gladiators um and especially him as a lead like he was and then coming back and seeing the second generation of the gladiators uh, so we have so much to get into let's get going this is the michael hearn show right here on generation iron let's rock and roll <laughs> <laughs> kid man um so i saw 30 for 30 and i know um, i saw you in 30 for 30. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, what was your thought of uh, seeing me in there? Seeing you or the whole 30 for 30 or both? Just me. Which I thought about? it was interesting because I thought you remarked, yeah, I think you said something to the effect that we were afraid you were going to take our job. The exact words is, I understood I was a representation of the person that was up next and I could understand the dislike for the first alternate. Well, have, or you somebody. Ever, have you ever felt like not I even once with you? Have you ever felt like I disliked you? <laughs> not once. <laughs> Never there was it. some guys, yeah. but I believed, and, and it would be, it would be, everybody's, because I think they did get something that I'm glad they got out in that is that to do it, you had to go hurt. You had to go no matter what, because you're so freaking replaceable, regardless of how we felt. I think it was, you know, it's like the uh, quarterback for Green Bay, Aaron Rodgers and the kid behind him. So I think maybe there's that always pressure. There's always that pressure that one day, you know, your run may end. You know, for me, I felt so bulletproof at that time. You know, like I knew how to do my job. I prepared for my job. I studied Shakespeare different quotes, different things I liked about famous actors. So after you interviewed me, I had lines prepared and I modeled kind of a character, even when they told us not to have characters. And so I was never worried about my job from someone else taking it. A hundred percent. I guess if you're Malibu, who did 13 episodes, great guy, be gladiator fired so there was that truth that was there like if you don't do your job you're out of here if you get hurt like you said michael does anybody else call you michael or just me yeah you do sexy butt michael, you call me michael michael, yeah. michael blue eyes <laughs> um, <Woo>. uh, <laughs> yeah. so if you didn't do your job if you got hurt you were fired so there was that pressure in being replaceable but I never looked at you or another man as a threat who was going to come and beat me and take my job because I was pretty secure where I was. I got to make this clear. That was never my quote or my 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 statement, especially about you, um, because my statement was, and and I think I learned so much from the 
first from being there as a youngster watching you. And I said this at the opening of this show. I said, I learned so much from you that helped me in Battledom after that, helped me in Gladiators later on that, and helped me understand as a youngster just the work ethic of I have to do my job. And even if I do it 100 freaking percent, something could happen and I'll lose it. And I'm not loved in the sense of the producers. The producers will replace you. If you're injured, you break your leg, you're replaced. Yeah, it it, it was, look, I I remember. And I just said that I learned from you specifically. Um, Don't know if I said that word right. Holy cow, can't even spell that word. Pacifically. (laughs) Because I'm from Washington State. I'm Pacifically. Pacifically. Not specifically. I'm a Pacific Islander. I'm part Japanese. Maybe it was just like coming to you, right? Oh, again, the love. But you know what's interesting, though, is, is, you know, where we are now is I learned from you. You know, I see the work and the, the dedication it takes. Um, like I was saying earlier, you know, when I walked in here, I look at all these amazing pictures on the wall and, and I, I want to be cut like you. I just don't want to do the work. So I admire you for that work. And there's certain things you've told me that stuck with me. Like after my uh, back surgery, I had a, a three level back, uh, two, two of the discs were replaced in the L5S1. I, I had a fusion. And I remember I was trying to come back and get in shape. And I don't remember, remember this. And I think I texted you one time. I said, say, I'm getting back to 300. And you're like, Dan, it doesn't matter how much you lift. It matters that you lift correctly and you strengthen the muscles. And that stayed with me through my whole back recovery, Michael, that you, uh, Mike, that you said that to me. And I said, okay, it doesn't matter. I don't need to get back to 500 pounds. I kind of lied. I've never done 500 pounds. <laughs> I don't need to get back to 478. Exactly my max. Um, you know, this is, it's okay. And another thing you said to me, which I remember, I don't know if it's still true, is that you don't drink anything but water. Mm-hmm. You know, every time I'm like having a uh, LaCroix, I'm like, ah, Arne wouldn't drink this, you know. But I said, okay. So, so there's been, it's, it's been a back and forth. And sometimes, you know, the master, you know, becomes a student. And, you know, I commend you for, you know, uh, being able to keep it together and, you know, looking like you do, you know, for all these years. Thanks, it's, it's just looking like I do. Bam. Um, I know what an effort that takes, you know, and, and to, you know, to go to that level, I, I, I just don't have it in me. I play pickleball instead. <laughs> <laughs> I started, went from CrossFit to a little pickleball, little pickleball. Uh. I, I absolutely love the fact that as that, that uh, new kid on the block and, and coming in and watching. Well, can I say, guys, one, look, when, on the new Gladiators, my favorite promo ever what? is like when they have you and you crack your neck. Yeah. You got to show that because I look at that and I was like, <laughs> I, I was like, uh, all right, O'Hearn got it right. You know, <laughs> you know make, make my day. What, 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 do you have a line there? Um, it was, uh, you're going to have to go through the Gladiators. And I go, <laughs> And they go, good luck with that. Yeah, that, that's the best promo ever. I remember <laughs> when I saw that promo of the new Gladiators, man, I was like, wow. I had you guys running like through, a, a, it looked like Mars. Oh, or it something. was. We, we shot up in plan. Malibu on the hills and they had fog machines out there and they had us. It was just so 300 Gladiator. The yes, movie Gladiator yes, yes. It was such a freaking thing. And it was, I have tingles going, we're set up. And I'm sitting there going, I love the fact that I was there then I was battle dumb and I'm there again. And I was so hyped. And I, I think just like you, and I'm glad years later, my belief on why they destroyed it. And this is straight up. Those producers destroyed that show is because they went way, like you said, there was way, it, was, it was overproduced. Oh, we got a new, new, new gladiator every week. Yeah. Hey, new game every single week. It wasn't about, it was about nitro. This, this, this freaking ultra, male handsome handsome is freaking anything. did you say handsome i said handsome okay but but besides handsome he he was handsome handsome, (laughs) and then he was good looking and then he was built and he had this freaking this flow of hair he He walked out like a stallion with the hair did you say hair that in past tense (laughs) is there a word like is there a word hair but it looked like a stallion didn't it because that hair was like that you got that thick asian hair and Ah, stuff it was like had had so um I was so hyped and they were like, you know, you're going to be this freaking team leader kind of guy for this. And then they started doing that stuff and I'm sitting there and I have to keep my mouth shut 
Yeah, you got to and, and, and I was just sitting there trying to help the other. I tried to be what I thought you were in the original because of the fact that I didn't. It wasn't my conversations with you. It wasn't what I read what you said. It was just me watching you perform how you you did it, how you were always prepared to the depth and you worked the mic better than any of them. And it's like and then you were athletically and you were just all this walking Greek God on camera. And I just I just OK, this is what he's doing. This is what he's doing. This is how he is. And when they came back to the new gladiators and they kept coming up with these new things and I'm like, oh, my gosh, you're spending all this. And it's just about David and Goliath. Yes. And it's about having real Davids yes. and Goliath, yes. which I loved about the original is because they had guys. They had girls who were badasses, not just the gladiators. They had contestants who were badasses. Yes. And it raises your game. And then when they brought the new one back, they was like, oh, let's talk about the story of him dropping 40 pounds. And well, what's... I think, Mike, you know, bigger, overproduced is not always better. Well, that was clear. Right. And they were trying to make it everything to everyone. And the heart of American Gladiators, as you said, was this idea that if you were an athlete and you didn't have that venue to continue to pursue your athletic dream, i.e. you didn't get drafted in the NFL, baseball, track, bat, whatever the sport, boxing, whatever it was, male and female, if you didn't have that, platform when american gladiators came out there was finally a platform where you could go test your athletic prowess where you could go test your metal against these larger than life as you said greek gods in the persona of the gladiators not only did you get a chance to test yourself as a human being but you got to do it on tv and it was such a big platform yeah and you got to do it in front of the world. You got to win money and possibly a car. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I think that essence of that was forgotten. So if you look at shows like Ninja Warrior, which has been uber successful, right? We're way too big. I don't know. Maybe you think you could do that. I, can, I couldn't. Mm, I'm way my, too big. My legs are yeah. massive. Yeah. You're like, just imagine. <laughs> you're, you're, <laughs> I jump. Good boats. <laughs> well, the whole thing. Yeah. The rig falls yeah. over. The rig falls over. But it's, it's a simple format. Well, well go it's, through the obstacle course, the which is a hard obstacle it's course. It's the eliminator. They took the eliminator. Yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah, good, that, point, good the, point. The American Ninja right. Warrior, in my opinion, is the eliminator. It really is. On Gladiators, wow. it's two guys going through a crazy obstacle course to see who can get there. And that true format of competition is the heart of American Gladiators, which they lost in the spectacular spe i'm gonna come and make up a word the spectacularism i'm gonna i could probably spell that because we haven't really got definition of that word yet so <laughs> uh, you know of, of all the special effects and all yeah. the splendor they lost that the true essence of um don't you think you could say that about a lot of shows titan games don't you think that's from gladiators again it was nbc same thing same setup same yeah. same uh graphics that was mm -hmm. my titan <laughs> that was that's the, true. They, they took that's my true. Titan. That's true. Um, but there's so many other, even even like those reality shows, MTV kind of, I don't know what those are. Serge, what are those kind of shows where they got the dating and the guys would compete against each other? I think within each human being, you know, it used to be, I think, more in a patriarchal society, more with men. You know, there's something within us that wants to compete. Yes. There's something within us that wants to show who we are and what we can do, that we can create and control our own future through hard work, dedication, and effort. And there's no better place to do that than in an athletic event. So that's hardwired in us. You know, and I watch those pl anim pl animal planet shows you know, you watch the, the apes, the chimpanzees. There is one male. There is one male who runs the pride. Lions, that one male. And that male, he runs that pride. 
He fathers all the kids. He protects everybody until a young buck, buck comes up and just says, hey, dude. I want a shot at the title. Yeah, yeah I want a shot at the title. And usually, you know, that, that young buck, if he doesn't beat the lion, beat the chim beat chimpanzee, beat the ape, he's outcast. So he has to literally risk his life to go and say, I think this is my time. You know, and I think that still, you know, I know it's in you, you know, and I know it's in me to think, you know, at certain times, this is my time and I'm going to do what it takes to get there. That and, is so hot wired in us. Yeah. And I think it's lost on this generation, you know, where I don't, you know, where I hear and now, and I will say this now, I think it's also with women. You know, a lot of women are finding that, you know, maternal instinct where I'm going to compete. I'm going to go do this. And that was one thing that was great about gladiators where men and women did exactly the same events. Yeah. And gladiators back in 1989, when it aired, it was revolutionary because the men and women weren't doing the same sports. And there was a female executive. I remember Julie Resch. Um, we have her on the. Netflix docuseries, if you haven't seen Muscles of Man, you got to see it. It's amazing. It's on Netflix now. Uh, they wanted to bring cheerleaders in the beginning. And she said, absolutely not. It's not that show. It's not that show. Look, you would be degrading the beautiful women, strong, muscular, physical female athletes we have. All the girls, Jazz, yeah. Ray, all the just. You would be by having cheerleaders oh. bounce around. And she stuck to her guns. And she made sure and she fought for it that the men and women would do the same thing and that they wouldn't have cheerleaders so women could stand on their own platform. So back we to- We were so ahead of the time. No, they, they absolutely, Come on. So, so back to today, I think a little bit of, I think a lot of that's lost. People don't want to work. People, like I said, have that attitude. I want to look like Mike, but I don't want to do the work to be like Mike. So I'm going to talk shit on Mike, you know, or Dan, you know what I mean? So I, I think that's, and I think it goes back to being in a society where everybody gets a medal. You finished last. Oh, good job, little Jimmy. You get a medal too. And I remember that so many times when I was young, I was the last guy picked. And that idea of being last, that idea of, um, you know, not being wanted, not being of value, that enhanced you, right? Drove me. Why is that a bad thing? That drove me. Why do they think it wouldn't happen? Why would they think that wouldn't send you down that path? Because the idea of building self-esteem now is you're wonderful, regardless of what you accomplish, take a medal. Right, so you don't, you build self-esteem through work. You build self-esteem through getting up every day, regardless if you're an engineer, you're a bodybuilder, you're an athlete, uh, a business owner, you get up work, you build that esteem by doing the work. That achievement, that daily progress is what gives you self-esteem. You know, the joy they found is in the progression not so much attaining the goal, right? Because as soon as you have that goal, I, oh, I won Mr. Universe. Okay, what's next, right? So we have to learn to find joy in that journey and the daily doing of things. Look, when I had a heart attack, ten, be 10 years ago, December, December 18th. I remember the 18th because it's my little sister's birthday. When I had a heart 49? attack. 49? Uh, for, yes, yeah. I'm, I'm 59 now. So this is December, it'll be a 10 year anniversary. I remember when I had that heart attack, there were so many things that you know, I thought were important. I thought the, well, for me, I thought the yeah. plaques on the walls, a couple yeah. of German cars yeah. in the driveway, the big house that, you know, I had with a wonderful woman. I said, that was what I thought was important. But when I was in the hospital and the doctor came in, the cardiologist came in and he asked me how long I've been having chest pain. The ambulance brought me there. And I told him, you know, it's been like two hours. And he said, uh, we have to rush you into surgery. And kind of making a joke out of it, I said, well, I'm going to make it, aren't I? You know, like, you got me, right, Doc? And, I, you know, you want him to say, I got you, kid, not on my watch. Right. He looks at me and he says, you know, you've been having this chest pain for a couple hours. Um, we'll do everything we can. I got to get you in there. 
didn't answer it. And I was, oh my God. And in that moment, all those things I thought were important became insignificant. And I can tell you very clearly what I wanted in that moment um, were two things. I wanted the people I knew to know how much I loved them. And I wanted them near me. That's all I cared about, Mike. I didn't care about anything else. And after that moment, you know, I, when I got home from the hospital a couple of days later, I had to rebuild my life on that principle. You know, I kind of shed a lot of my material things I had. I got out of my relationship, you know, found a, a new relationship. And uh, the other, other one was fantastic, but it just, I, I, it was, I just wasn't happy and I was afraid to make a move because I didn't want to hurt her. And I completely rebuilt my life on the principles of knowing what was important to me, of getting the answers, right, to the test before the test. That makes sense. It does, because I, I love that. A great quote was, a healthy man wants 100 things, a sick man wants one. So after the heart attack, um, I had a, uh, the, I kept, I wore the bracelet around my wrist from the hospital just as a reminder to be grateful. And I wrote a book called F Dying, you know, how almost dying, you know, kick, but so anyways, uh, and, and I wore, I wore this bracelet all the time. And then I remember about eight months, I was standing in my kitchen after the heart attack. And all of a sudden the bracelet just went poof. It fell off and it floated to the ground. And Michael, I don't know why, but I just started weeping. I was standing in the middle of my, you know, kitchen, just crying. And I, I didn't quite understand it. Um, but that night I had a dream. And in my dream that night, I'm half Japanese. I was uh, by, I am half Japanese, but in my dream, I'm by a river in Japan. And there's cherry blossoms. And there's a Japanese master there. And I'm this, this 10-year-old little kid. You know, 10 years old was when I lost my older brother. He was 12, so maybe that's why it was 10. And uh, I'm just crying, crying, inconsolable. And I was like, I, I don't know what to do with my life. I don't know how to live. I'm so scared. And there was an older Zen master next to me. And he said um, these words to me. He said, life is not lost by dying. Life is lost minute by minute, day by day, by not really living. And I woke up and I was like, that's it. And I've never had a tattoo. At the time I was 50, I never had a tattoo. I wrote that down on a piece of paper, what he said to me. And that's the only tattoo I have. And it's right here on my arm. Life is not lost by dying. Life is lost minute by minute, day by day, by not really living. And I don't know how much time we got. I used to think time was guaranteed. When we were young, right? Yo, before the heart attack, I thought time was guaranteed. Yeah, right. Got plenty of time. But, oh. and, and I know, you know, time is not guaranteed. I can worry about this. I can worry about that. Yeah. I know time isn't. Yeah, I just, I used to think time, life was, time was guaranteed. And I know it's not guaranteed. So I no longer say someday. That was one word I took out of my vocabulary. Oh, yeah, someday I'm going to do this. Someday I'm going to do that. Now I either say, someone says, what about Africa? Oh, someday. I said, no, it's not in my plans. Or I'm going to say, yes, I'm going to do it. And let, let me book it six years from now. And if I need the money, I'm going to save up for it. You know what I'm saying? Oh, let's go do this. And, you know, after the heart attack, the next year I went to um, Bora Bora. I'd always said someday. Even when I was married for a few years, you know, I, oh, well, you know, did, it was after Gladiators. I was broke for a while and I was just like, oh, I don't have money and money. Someday I'll go there. And I, I had money. I went boom. <laughs> I went there. So if there's one thing, you know, um, I can say, Mike, is just lose the word someday from your vocabulary. A, a goal without a plan is just a dream, right? Yeah. If there's something that you want to go after, start today you know i have a 12 year old stepson and my 12 year old stepson it's hard in this day and age when you're financially able to to not give your kids everything <laughs> right go go right. with this <laughs> right I like not where you're them, going not kid. to give them everything because it's so easy oh you need a new bike great 300 bucks okay you know you need this great whatever oh great so he's been wanting a phone forever and I said, it's just so easy just to go give him a phone. You know, you go to whoever, this carrier, $29. You pay it off in two years. And I said, you know, no. Like we were talking about earlier, I want him 
to understand what it feels like to set a big goal and work hard to accomplish that. Because that's how you build self-esteem. You start at a young age, you pick something that seems insurmountable. No way I can do that. And then you realize if you break something down into small chunks, do it repetitively over time, you can climb the highest mountain. So he was, what was he, 11 at the time? So I said, you want a phone? He was like, yeah, yeah, I want a phone. I said, 5,000 push-ups. <laughs> He's like, 5,000 push-ups? And he said, I can't do 5,000 push-ups. And I said, you can. And he's like, how do I do 5,000? You know, I think he was actually 10 because I have the thing. Because I'm 10. How can I do 5,000 push-ups? He started when he 10. He finished when he was 11. Yeah. So I said, this is how we're going to do it. And this is you know, any big goal that I want. Like I'm, I'm writing you know, two movies about life rights. And I do the same thing. I said, okay. So you're going to take push-ups. I said, how many push-ups can you do in a day? If you did some before breakfast, some before lunch, he said, well, I could probably do 25. So I took a box on, on a board and I wrote a draw, drew boxes. I drew 25 boxes. I drew boxes, each one representing 25 push-ups, until it reached 5,000. Each day, you're going to check a box. So I think it's important, son, that you can see your tangible progress. And there's something about the human being that wants to fill in that X. And gets the so we went through this, and he went from there's no way I could do 5,000 push ups to some days, get this, Michael, begging me to do more push ups because his limit was 25. Then his limit was 50 in one day. Then on a weekend, he was like, uh, Dan, can, can, I, can I do 150 today? <laughs> you know, you have an 11 year old kid begging to do 150 push ups. So he ended up finishing that, and I got them the phone. You know, and I said, look, I, I will never take this away from you. I may shut off your service. <laughs> you know, if you're looking at the bad stuff, but I will never take this away from you, son. You've earned this. And know that you can use this same principle to get anything you want, right? Day by day, small efforts. That's brilliant. Because I was going to say, how, how do we... We had to go through so much, and I know our parents tried to teach us the same thing. There's so much that they told us, and we were too young to listen to those. Uh, the uh, life is wasted on the youth because there's so much <laughs> that we know when we get to an older age. You go, don't worry about these little things because they're all little things. Just focus on you and what you want, and. You well, teach it's, it's hard because a lot of times it, it is hard. So you know how do you, you teach them? How do you teach the youngster that's watching this today? I think what you share with them that there's probably going to be a lot of things they're interested in at 20 years old, at 23, at 24, at 25. The beauty in it, in it is you don't have to make a choice. You can try things. You can go experiment with things. You know, the kids who are now in their 20s, I believe, are going to be lived. I think the life expectancy is going to go up. You know, God forbid we have some catastrophe. You know, it's going to probably be 120 years old. So they're not even a quarter of the way there. So the idea of something gets you up in the morning. If something interests you, go down that path. That path is not forever. That, and you go down that path and you say, you know, I did this for a year. You know, I was a set designer. Nah, I don't like that. And just be open. Be open to what excites you. So people are so often, I, I have no passion. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know what I'm passionate about. And that's okay. You go out and you try things and forget that word passion. Just look at things that keep your interest. You know, like what keep your interest enough where you want to go do it another day and just explore and explore and explore. And most likely what you pick is not what you're going to be. My son went to my, my oldest son who lives in Portugal. Now he went to uh, law school, um, finished law school, practiced law for a year at one firm. I don't like this kind of law when practice another law. Oh, this law is great. A year later, I don't like that kind of law. Oh, wow. A year later, so I'm going to open my own practice. Open his own practice for six months. I don't like that either. I'm going to go to another business. He started another business uh, with his partner, Brian. And it's a recruiting business. They do uh, C-suite execs and startups. And they're crushing it. 
they're crushing it. But he also went to chiropractic school. You know, so he tried this things. This little genius you, yeah. you sprouted. <laughs> oh, you no, wiggled your toes on that one. <laughs> Holy cow. So he tried a bunch of things, Mike. And, um, you know, he's finally find, found something he liked. Yeah. But this recruiting business, it's all here in the States. They just work virtually in Portugal. It's going fantastic. And he's like, I think I want to do real estate. So he just, you know, got his license over there. And he's also flipping some homes. So just follow what your interests are. It doesn't mean it's forever. But if you don't take that step and at least open some doors, you're never going to know. Can we agree that, uh, especially being so young on gladiators and stuff and, and already being known, don't chase it if you're chasing it solely for money or fame? That's a tough one to keep keep alive. It, you know, I made that mistake. You know, I'm like living proof. Um, I thought I think uh, I thought fame was going to lead to happiness. You know, um, I, I, you know, as a young guy, you know, growing up as a kid, uh, you know, I mistook applause and adoration as love. Because I felt like I probably, you know, uh, and I'm not here, oh, poor me, but I, pro I didn't get a lot of love from a Japanese mom who traditionally through their culture is not very emotional. I know she loves me to hell now. You know, I just didn't feel that way. And a dad who was a, you know, a Marine from Iowa, you know, and I'm half Japanese and well, I was born in Japan. We moved back here. He was one of those guys like, we don't speak that in my house. <laughs> you know, he was of that time. Right. You know, and so that, and he drank. So that gives you an idea of my childhood. So I was out searching for admiration to be seen. And for me, that football gave me that you know when people were clapping for me when I sacked the quarterback I think I mistook that for like oh you know they love me they love me they love me I just didn't know it was applause and even through gladiators I kept chasing that you know and and uh, it got to a point I think when we were at the height of the show uh, where I would find myself too many mornings you know drunk and high out of my mind on the floor just crying you know, and it was just a weird, weird thing. Like, I have everything I want, but yet it feels like, you know, it feels like nothing. And in that moment, there was a lot of self-introspection. Because it didn't just happen once, it happened quite a few times. And then what really scared me is one day I was just driving down Sunset Boulevard. And, and I just started crying for no reason. I'm like... I didn't even cry. I've never cried, you know, when I was growing up and my brother died, you know, I didn't cry. I just, and men don't cry. You know, there was, was my, my dad taught me men don't cry. Big boys don't cry. And, um, and I, I, that, you know, is when, you know, 1980, I don't know, yeah, 1993, 1992, somewhere in that area where I, you know, just kind of had to raise my hand up, Michael, and just say, look, something's not right. I need help. And it was really hard to do back then because not a lot of guys, big, strong guys, yeah, you know, no. were, were getting therapy. Therapy, when I was growing up, is were for crazy people, yep. right? Someone in the neighborhood, Mike, right? Yep. They got therapy. Oh, there's Jimmy Bob. He's got hey, therapy. 91, 93, those, yeah. that early 90s? Yeah, he was crazy. So I, so I went and, you know, I went and raised my hand and I started seeing a therapist and it's something I do to this day. You know, I've gone on and off for the last 35 years and you know, um, had to lift up the hood and do a lot of, a lot of deep introspection and work to understand that, you know, there, there's things that I do, but it doesn't necessarily mean who I am. You know, I'm a good friend. I'm a freaking great brother. You know, I'm a pretty darn good dad. Now I'm a good partner to, to, um, my, uh, significant other. Uh, I'm someone who's, you know, as a creator, I'm attracted to, to masculine, Men, maybe that's why we're here. I'll <laughs> no, put that on the record right there. I'm masculine. I'm, I'm a badass. Well, the second part is I'm attracted to masculine men with um, tough backstories who found a way to Agreed. overcome their past. Agreed. Overcome their past or men's stories who rose up from the primordial soup of life who've lifted their heads up and faced all odds 
and become more than perhaps they were predestined to be. So stories of struggle, heartbreak, and in the end, triumph. Because I feel like most heroes have a pain to purpose story. And I have to show the pain because if you go through the work, winning feels so much better. If you are confused about training, do not worry. That's what the Titan training plan is for. For you guys to subscribe to this plan, you also get the additional coaching from me in the Titan private group. Get in there today, and I cannot wait to start working with you and making your dreams come true. Let's get back to the show. Let me ask you this question. How long did you train before that first Mr. Universe, before you won it? Uh, 11 years. 11 years. Yeah. So if you don't enjoy the 11 journey, years, your journey to win that first one was 11 years. You better damn well get some enjoyment out of what you're doing because it takes 11 years to get five minutes of glory, two minutes of glory on that stage when they're saying your name. Yeah. So, and, and, and I, I want to be really clear when I say enjoy, that does not mean that, you know, you're, you're, you're doing your last rep, you're, you know, you're gassed, you're burning, you're feeling so much pain, you're going to cry. People think that when they find their passion, when they find the thing they're put on this planet to do, if there is such a thing, oh, it's going to be wonderful all the time. I'm going to be so happy and there's going to be this oh, aria music. It's not that way, you know. Training for me, people think, you know, someone who's trained for 59 years, oh, it's easy for you. You, you must love it. Yeah. There's yeah, yeah. <laughs> days, as you know, Michael, when it sucks ass. You're tired. You don't want to get up, but you know you've got a 6 a.m. if you're doing a split that first morning. You know, it's not freaking enjoyable. I want to, you want to stay in bed. You got a beautiful wife. You know, you want to go hang out with your kid. No. It's not, every moment's not going to be enjoyable. But what's enjoyable is how you feel about yourself as a human being after you keep your word to yourself about something you say you want to do and you want to be. You keep that word to yourself is how you build that self-esteem and that confidence. And that's where the joy is. I think the key to success, if I could put it down to one thing, it's... The ability to get yourself to do something that you don't want to do, but that you need to in order to reach the goal for that day or the dream. So it's the ability when you're tired, when you don't feel like it, when you don't want to, when your friends are calling and saying, hey, dude, come on, hang out, we'll party this some you know. It's the ability to get yourself to do something when you don't want to, that you know you need to in order to become who you're gonna be. That is the one key to success. Let's talk about gladiators a little more. Then I then, then um I know we gotta jump. Let's talk about gladiators. Okay, let's let's that's gladiators, jump in there. new gladiators, um, old gladiators, Netflix. I'm so excited about Netflix. So tell me. So excited tell me, about tell Netflix. Me, show. What are we Most gonna see? Mayhem. What are we gonna see? You're gonna see spandex, you're gonna see glory. I know that we got the call for 30 for 30. How I told them not to call you for this one. I said, I don't want that young, big, buff dude <laughs> with those blue eyes, no wrinkles, taking my thunder. So tell me, <laughs> tell me how did this come about? So, um, you know, 10 years ago, again, one of those things where no one was asking me for anything. I sat down. I, you know, I've been writing for years. I've written yep. tons of screenplays, directed a movie, blah, blah, blah. So, um, but I'd never written a book. Because I always thought, and a lot of times we frame things in our mind, preconceived ideas that are not true. But I said, only smart people write books, right? I said, I can write a script. Because a script, there's a lot of empty space on the page. There's dialogue. Oh, but oh, I can't write a book. You know, I'm, I'm not that smart. So I had to overcome that fear day by day, one page at a time. And 10 years, I wrote a book called Gladiator, a true, true story of Roy's rage and redemption. Right. Like anything else, I'd never written a book. And it did well. It did very well. It was a bestseller. It was Simon and Schuster. It's I, they ju they were just re-releasing it. Uh, Good. Uh, it's, it's, Good. If you look at Amazon, it's, it's re-released right now. But um, you know, it was just one of those things where I said, "I've got a story inside of me. I want to put it down, and I want to tell it. 
I don't know how to do it, but you know what I know? I can figure shit out, right? I can figure shit out. I can figure out like if someone else has done it, then I can do it. I have that belief in myself, but I have to overcome the fear of failing looking like a jackass, looking like, oh, this illiterate guy in spandex who used to punch people thinks he's going to be a writer? Guy in spandex that look good in spandex. Okay, go on. Thank you, handsome. Did you say handsome? Did you say handsome? I did say handsome. (laughs) So I said, um, so I sat down and wrote this book. And again, nobody was asking for me for it. And, you know, the funny thing was, I don't think I've ever told you this was, I wrote the book, went out and tried to sell it with a big agency. It didn't sell. Then your show gladiators came out and this idea that nobody wanted jumped on all of a sudden was a great idea right when your gladiators came out they're like yeah so you may be working on something and you heart may be behind it but the timing may just be off but that you know one thing my mom used to say you know in japanese she used to say a lot of things but she would say delayed does not mean denied i remember when this came out and i remember how it kicked ass and you were on Good Morning America and all these shows and talking about it. It was a great process for me emotionally to write that book, right? It felt good. That book was in production with a big company and uh, they said they're going to make a movie and all this didn't happen. But when it got out of option, this little producer in Canada called me. When I say little, a young guy, never heard of him, never heard of his company. He said, that would make a good docuseries. And I just watched Michael Jordan's The Last Dance, which I thought was fabulous, right? Fabulous story. And I said, oh, interesting. I said, I think so too. And he said, my partner, a guy named Peter Sussman, like the most fantastic guy I've ever met in show business. Um, he was a EP on Shit's Creek, Shit's Creek, as well as CSI. He kind of funded that. So he was his partner. And um, we said, we can get you a meeting at Netflix. Are you ready to pitch? I had nothing, Mike. I, I, had, I had nothing. What year was this? This was two and a half years ago. Okay. I had nothing as a pitch as far as a docuseries. Right. But... You know what I know? What? I know I can get shit done. Okay. <laughs> right? I know I can get shit done if I just put my mind to it. I just have that belief in myself. Maybe I read too many Tony Robbins books when I was young. <laughs> Which ain't a bad thing. <laughs> Unlimited power. I know if I visualize it, I see it, I set the time, I put my mind to it, I break it down to small steps, I know I can get shit done. So I came up with a pitch based upon a similar storyline of The Last Dance. Where if you watch The Last Dance, um, The Last Dance... The whole idea that the Bulls should have gotten a chance to win their seventh ring, right? The seventh championship, Michael Jordan should have, but they didn't because management interfered. They thought the Bulls franchise was bigger than the stars. So I said, oh, and I love how that's the through line of that series, but the heart of it is Scottie Pippen, Michael Jordan, and the rest of the Bulls players. So I took it and I said, you know what? I'm going to use that as a blueprint, something that's already successful, something that's already made. So I took it and I wrote out a whole pitch, broke broke it down into six episodes in one week, um, told the emotional stories, the true stories, my stories that I knew, that I'd written in the book that probably most people are embarrassed to talk about. And I tell about getting hit and, you know, having that shit taken out. I tell about my balls shrinking from taking steroids. I tell about laying on the floor, you know, crying, you know, and, and my big brother dying in my arm. You know, I just very heartfelt because I think people want human stories to wrap that up in something that they know. You know, like I know gladiators, but I didn't know the story behind it. So I went and pitched uh, my partner, Kyle, at Game 7. We became partners on this project. Went and pitched uh, Netflix and literally... The guy said, oh, my God, I took this meeting as a courtesy to a friend, you know, Peter, you know, uh, as a courtesy. I had no idea it was going to be so awesome because I want to do this. So they basically bought it in the room. Freaking love that. And it was uh, a terrifying, but an amazing experience. Um, I've always been talent, not talented, (laughs) just talent. I've always been, you know, that that person in front of the camera. Yeah. Now you're everything. Well, yeah. And it was interesting uh, and also uh, you know because you have a vision you have a story you want to tell and then as a creator in this medium you turn it over to the directors and it becomes their vision and i had to be okay with how they may portray me Mm -hmm. i can say this is how i want you to show me show me my left side this is my good side you know don't you know you know don't show this wrinkle light me this way but you have to totally give over and, and trust 
and be okay because it no longer was my vision. It was their vision along with the collective stories of you know, Laser and Tower and Zap and Ice and Blaze and Sky and Diamond. And, you know, is everybody's collective story told through this blueprint. And it's so good. And it was, a lot of it was dark and violent. You know, like the book is, it's dark and violent where me and Laser are in Palm Springs, you know, spring break, uh, first year of the Gladiators. And uh, we end up getting in, you know, pulling the car over on Main Street and we end up getting into a fist fight. We're literally punching each other in the face uh, right there, you know, boom. You like, and Jim. Yeah, me and Laser. We're just like, you know, like, you know, F you, f you, what kids, what boom, boom, you want to go, you want to go? And we just started, you know, we're 24, 25, boom, just start hitting each other. And there's a crowd around us. And, you know, we're big dudes. Nobody wants yeah, to jump yeah, into that. Yeah. And I remember when Laser and I were on the ground, I got him, you know, like, there was no jujitsu back then. I just got him in a good old fashioned headlock. Right. <laughs> so I got Laser in a headlock and he's under me. And then all of a sudden, while he's under me, I hear this. Grrr, ah, and I feel something, and he bites it, me in the face. No rules in the he literally street fighting. bites me in the face. He, he's holding onto my cheek like a freaking Rottweiler. And I remember to this day, because it was such a surreal moment, it took me out of the fight. And I, I, I have he's like biting my face, and I'm just like, it's almost like I flew outside of my body. And it was like- You were looking at it. Yeah, like, hey, there's no biting and fighting. <laughs> head <laughs> you know it was this moment i was like, there's no biting and fighting so i push away you know and i get up and i remember he's still on the ground and you know we had another buddy floyd wranglin who was there and he's on the ground and he reaches up and i'm like we're cool we're cool but i couldn't get that idea that my best friend at that time bit me in the face you can fight me you know best friends you can fight which i would never do that today um but you can fight me but just don't bite me so as he's getting up, you know, reach his hand to get up. I just remember I took back and I went, bam, I hit him right in the forehead as hard as I could. And I was like, you f that's for biting me. You know, he falls back down, his eye swells up. You know, we get up and, you know, we kind of hug it out. You know, sorry, you know, all that. So Jared Hess, the director, along with Tony Vianuka, Jared Hess claimed to fame as a Napoleon Dynamite, Nacho right. Libra. Right. So he's just got this sort of levity about him, this sense of humor. So he ends up as... Laser, Jim Caliphat and I are telling that story where, you know, he's cutting back and forth to Jim and, I, Jim and I, then he's telling that story and they animate it. So you got us. Oh my gosh. He-Man style. Yeah. And he's in our spandex, right. driving the Jeep, my, my CJ7 Jeep hey. in Palm Springs. You, know, you want to go? And they're, they're showing it. We get out and we start to fight. But he does it in the cartoon uh, Bugs Bunny Wiley Coyote fight, where all of a sudden we fight and there's a bunch of dust and you see oh, arms and legs. It. It's like, whoosh, 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 and you see this dust in the middle of the fight. All of a sudden the dust stops and, we, and he, we, he shows us both panting, going, <laughs> taking a break. Then we go back in, you know. So he found a way to find tremendous humor, humor in, in, in saying. So this is going to be a docu. But it's not as dark and ominous as most of them are that take you on that spin. Or it is still that, because the reality of it, it was tough. Yeah, so, you know, I think it's a couple things. One, it's a rip-roaring romp back to the 90s. Oh, you know, which is great. The music beats, I think, you know, oh. Buster Rhymes is one of the needle drops, you know. Um, I like Big Butts, I can't, yeah. you know, whatever yeah. those songs yeah. were of that generation. Uh, Seattle boy. It's going to take you right back there to that time. Right. It shows gladiators as the heroes that we remember. Yes, it does show some tragic, hard, and dark moments. But I think we come out of that, and it's in the end, it's triumphant. It's so cool that, uh, again, um, from me as a student um, with you guys, and watching you and studying under you, huge help to me in my entire career in life. I had no idea because man. of that. I, yeah, I had no idea, it, Michael. It's just so. It's you know. It's honestly. It's we studied. It's, it's, it's a bit flattering and, and touching, and uh, you know that we had uh, any impact on you because you've so much blazed your own trail. So I'm, uh, you know, I'm really humbled and I'm really in, you know, great admiration of you know what you've uh, been able to do and, and accomplish, man. It's. Uh, 
yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty freaking amazing. I appreciate it, brother. But seriously, from me to you is that sitting there and, and, and studying by watching, and we've talked about this, is just a different time. Now, you know, I want to say, uh, you know, again, um, thanks for, you know, having me on here. It's, uh, and your words have been, um, you know, just so kind. And, you know. Um, we've known each other a long time. Yeah, but we haven't talked enough. Yeah. You know, we haven't talked enough. I think sometimes when you're so busy trying to be who you're meant to be and lead and inspire that you forget that there's a brotherhood, a sisterhood to connect with, of people going through the same things. And uh, I hope that we can, you know, connect more and, uh, again, appreciate you. I'd love to come back. I want to hear, hear what you think about the show. I want to talk, um, you know, all the training things, you know, that I, you're doing, that I'm doing, from ice bath to therapeutic peptides to, you know, whatever it may be. Um, and just uh, continue this conversation, man. Done. Appreciate you. Done. And let's try to get into a fight where I can bite you. That'd be kind of cool. Never done You're that too before. big for me now, son. You're too big for me now, son. <laughs> That's it. Guys, see you next week. Have a great day. He's out.